the Society for Ecological Restoration uh, Midwest Great Lakes Chapter Board. And we're the co-sponsors for this uh, event tonight. Um, yeah, and I'd just like to uh, welcome everybody and thanks for taking time out of your evening to uh, listen to this uh, webinar. Uh, we're gonna have uh, several speakers. We'll introduce them uh, shortly, uh, but first we're gonna have uh, Joe, uh, one of the uh, students who worked on the DEI committee do a, a land acknowledgement just to start out. Wanna go ahead, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. And especially thank you to our speakers for sharing your expertise with us all. We would like to acknowledge the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus, where many of us learn, work, and sit today, is a land grant university built on stolen land from within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people, Minnesota Makocha. The Dakota people have lived here for over a thousand years before this land was forcibly taken from them by the United States and the state of Minnesota and granted to the university in part through the Morrill Act of 1862. With this in mind, we share our gratitude and wish to honor the land and the Dakota people that have nurtured and stewarded it for centuries and continue to do so today. It is also important to note that acknowledgement of this historical injustice is only one small part of supporting indigenous communities and efforts need to be made towards healing this injustice for indigenous people today. We call on all members of the university community to play a role in this healing wherever possible. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Joe, for that land acknowledgement. And uh, yeah, I also wanted to well, have the chance to thank uh, SCR Global for uh, supporting the project with uh, a grant that was given to our uh, chapter, regional chapter, to help uh, set up this event, um, as well as the uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, which included uh, Joe and uh, a couple other students, undergrad students at the University of Minnesota, to help set this up. All right, yeah, and then. Uh, just transitioning into the, the topic for the night, then we have uh, several speakers uh, here who are going to, several different uh, Indigenous members who are going to talk about their experience of the environment, uh, how it's, how they view it, and some of their experience with uh, projects, both kind of the local restoration management projects in Twin Cities and some bigger picture climate change adaptation projects. Um, that's going to be our, our third speaker. Um, and the, the three speakers are, I'll just introduce them briefly now, and then I'll give a little bit more, uh, longer one for Basile uh, Panik. He's the first one. Um, he's undergraduate student at Northern Michigan University, a member of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And he's gonna talk about the grammar of animacy, viewing the environment through the lens of the Ojibwe language. And then we have Farron Davis Anderson. He's a supervisor of environmental sciences for the Shakopee Walking in Sioux community, and she's a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. She's going to talk about habitat restoration projects in urban tribal lands. And then last of all, I have Brian and Stippen talk. He's the program director of the National Indian Carbon Coalition and a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. Uh, he's going to talk about development of carbon projects on tribal nation lands. Uh, okay, and with that, you know, we'll have uh, then Bazil. Uh, talk. We'll have each person talk for about 20 minutes, more or less, and we ask the audience just to kind of hold their questions or write and take a note, write them down until the end, or you can enter them in the Q&A box. All right. Thanks. Well, well, yeah, I mean, good, Chris. Thank you. Bonjour, everybody. My name is Basile Panik. I come from the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians at Northern Michigan University. I'm a student here. So um, miigwech, thank you to the Bioproducts and Biosystems Engineering uh, Department at UMN Twin Cities, and then also the Society for Ecological Restoration um, for inviting me here to be here today. I'm really excited um, to speak with students, especially. I think that's always my favorite thing to speak with fellow students and um, kind of see where we're at in uh, each of our academic disciplines. So my discipline is Native American studies, a little different than science and engineering. So I hope I can add some um, additional perspectives to what all of you are studying. So I'm gonna share a presentation today. Hopefully, hopefully um, if somebody could enable participant screen sharing, 
Um, it's not allowing me to right now. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, all of you should be able to see that. Yeah, looks good. Awesome, thank you. So the title of my presentation today is The Grammar of Animacy. Uh, viewing the environment through the lens of the Ojibwe language. So we're going to um, hop into some of these water droplets. I tried to make them look like water droplets as much as possible. Hopefully it does um, on this spider web here. Um, and use some words as examples to understand um, the Ojibwe people's relationship with the environment. First, uh, who am I? Um, give you an introduction to myself. Um, so yeah, as I said, my name is Basile Panic. I come from the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians. Our reservation is uh, Red Cliff, Wisconsin. It's as far north in Wisconsin as you can go. I grew up on a reservation there for all of my life, um, except here when I'm in Marquette, Michigan. I'm studying Native American studies at Northern Michigan University. It's in the Upper Peninsula, if anybody is familiar with that area. We just got um, over 30 inches of snow. I think it was a record-breaking um, snowpocalypse. Some people are calling it that. I'm not a fluent speaker. Um, people people ask me a lot of the time if I'm a fluent speaker, but uh, not not even close. Our language is super complicated, known as one of the hardest languages to learn in the world. Um, but I am just using language as a method for sharing our uh, perspectives on the environment with you all. As always, I like to recognize Nima Ma, Minawan, and Dede, my mom and my dad, for um, the, the upbringing that they've uh, provided me. Um, I feel extremely privileged that they've allowed me to participate in our culture and speak the language and participate in ceremony as much as they have. Uh, without them, I wouldn't be where I am today. So today we're gonna cover a few things. These are learning outcomes for uh, the next 20 minutes or so with my presentation at least. We're going to gain a broad understanding of the Anishinaabe people's relationship with the environment through the method of language. Um, if you're not familiar with the Anishinaabe people, we're the uh, indigenous groups surrounding the Great Lakes region. We're made up of three smaller nations, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Uh, specifically, I'm, I'm Ojibwe and belong to that nation. So we're going to enhance the understanding of your field through, um, oh, I have some grammatical errors, uh, adding an Indigenous perspective to your discipline. We're going to experience some paradigm shifts in the way that we view um, the environment. Uh, some lights are turning off in the classroom that I'm in, so I'm going to get up and walk for a second. Okay, awesome. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so we're going to experience some paradigm shifts in the way that we view the environment. Gishbin Bakana Ginesa de Tanawa get a Kimanan. Perhaps it will be a different way for you to view our world. Nimbungo Sendan is a Chigayang Nandaga Kinadawin Oma. Truly, I hope that we can all learn from each other today. So as I said, we're gonna dive into these water droplets and um, first we're gonna cover the grammar of animacy. So the grammar of animacy comes from Robin Wall Kimmerer's book titled uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, it's a section title, Learning the Grammar of Animacy in her first chapter of the book. She opens this section with a quote, to be native to a place, we must learn to speak its language. Similarly, my dad has always said that if the, if the trees around us could speak, if the water, if the, if the rocks even, um, or the animal relations, if they could speak in a way that we would understand, they would be speaking an indigenous language. So we're gonna use uh, the Ojibwe, Ojibwe Molin, the Ojibwe language today. 
you might hear uh, Chippewa a lot of the time, which is an anglicized version of Ojibwa or Ojibwe. Um, Ojibwe is the specific nation that I belong to as a part of the Anishinaabe, as I mentioned. And Ojibwe Moen is, uh, Moen is language, so uh, the Ojibwe language. Our language is split up into two different categories. We have animate and inanimate. So animate being alive and inanimate being not alive. Uh, it's very, it's a very verb heavy language. If you read this section within her book, um, she, Robin Wall Kimmer talks about a bay um, in English being a noun and that it, it's kind of constricted by um, just its current state. But when we give it a verb to be a bay, uh, it allows it to exist as a bay and, and practice um, what is known for that being to do as, as a larger spirit being, um, kind of this metaphysical to be a bay. It's releasing, I think she says that it's releasing it from the bondage of being a noun. So a subakinshi, this is our first word that we're gonna use today to explain the Ojibwe's relationship with the environment. Um, we're gonna work backwards on this word and uh, break down each part of it. She uh, means the one who does something. Uh, back again, ike uh, means making something. A sub is the word for a net. So when we're saying a subakinshi, um, we are literally referring to the net maker. Uh, so I'll, I'll let you all repeat that at home um, or in, in your live Zoom room, a subakinshi, a subakinshi. So this is an animate noun. So animate being living. We're recognizing this being um, the net maker. So when we think about the net maker, uh, we're giving something like that intelligence. Uh, they have that ability, ability to make something. So that's our word for spider. Um, that spider makes those webs that provide food for, for their families or um, provides food, provides a home. So when we're referring to a sub as, or the spider as the net maker, uh, they, they have an intelligence enough to do so to make a net. And as such, uh, reverence is built in the language. And um, beings like the spider deserve a deeper look other than just this gross, scary um, arachnid or, or insect or animal. So they deserve a deeper look. And that's what's ingrained in the Ojibwe language is that this being is intelligent, he's, he's living, um, and that he deserves a better look. Manumen, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this term. Uh, Manumen is the word for wild rice. So the Anishinaabe people, he uh, migrated here from the Eastern part of the United States because we were given uh, different prophecies, seven, seven prophecies of which direction we were supposed to go and um, what we were supposed to follow. So one of the sections, one of the prophecies says that uh, the path to their chosen ground, a land in the West to which they must move their families. So we must uh, move to the West, our families um, through this path um, in order to find the food that grows on water. And, and that's what's known as Manumen. So those of you who are look, working um, or researching within land and water resources, uh, make sure Manumen is safe, uh, develop sustainable uh, systems that allow for, or they don't allow for the poisoning of our waters. Uh, oil pipelines constantly threaten manumen. Um, it's, it's vulnerable to climate change. And so those of you who are in those research areas, manumen is a precious resource to the Anishinaabe people and in other indigenous people as well. I'm going to share a short clip of my mom doing some wild racing. You can see how it's harvested. Um, she's practicing her treaty rights um, in the ceded territory of which all of you exist in or closely exist in. Um, so she's practicing, practicing her treaty rights that were given to us in the Treaty of 1854, the right to hunt and fish and gather.
So next we're going to um, cover wee gloss. So wee gloss is the, the white birch tree or uh, Latin term Betula papar papariferra. Um, wee gloss is an animate noun. Again, we're, we're recognizing that this being is an, uh, a living, living being. It has a spirit behind it. However, in, in Western culture, especially within uh, forestry or logging or different industries, birch bark, the, the bark that comes from birch trees is known as a waste byproduct. So it's, it's just waste, it's thrown aside. Maybe it's used for um, biomass or um, different things, but usually it's just, it's just thrown away or burned up. But for Anishinaabe people and a lot of indigenous communities where uh, we gloss grows, we have, <clears throat> uh, it's a very versatile material. We make a lot of things from it. One of those is we gloss a G-mon, so a birch bark canoe. This is Wayne Valier here with one of the birch bark canoes that he made. Um, on the sides, you can see that uh, black glue almost, uh, the Ojibwe word for that is begu. It comes from uh, spruce trees. And then we have we gloss in the cuck, so a uh, birch bark basket here. And this one is a, a simpler one. Um, they get pretty intricate with the designs that you can um, scrape on them. I think we have some basswood wrapping around the top on that rim. So this is Wigwasi Makuk. Wigwasi Kamig. Um, so we have a wigwam right there. And uh, surrounding it is that, that birch bark. Birch bark is naturally waterproof um, from the inside. And then, so it, it covers, covers the wigwam for a living space and protection from the environment. <clears throat> and then remember, this is known as a waste byproduct to Western culture. And um, those were just three examples of what Anishinaabe people specifically use birch bark for. Uh, Gizis. Gizis is our word for sun. Again, this is an animate noun, so the, uh, this sun is a spirit. It's a living being. In science, we're starting to use this as a through passive and active solar solar systems, photovoltaic systems convert sunlight into electricity. So that's what we're using it today in Western culture and um, larger society for Anishinaabe people. Uh, we have always known that the sun is a powerful being. We make prayers to the sun, um, grandfather's son, every morning. Uh, we say, miigwech, thank you for, for showing yourself, providing the warmth that we need, the sunlight, uh, and all the life that you provide to all, all creation. We also recognize uh, his pattern east to west, sun rises in the east, sets in the west. We recognize that pattern in a lot of our ceremonies. Some of our lodges have an Eastern entrance and then um, an exit through the West side of it. And then, so we, we recognize that direction and um, face the East when we, when we make prayers in the morning and, and face the West when we make prayers in the evening. This is a painting by Norval Morriso uh, titled The Spiritual Feast. Um, so you can see that the, the sun is connected to all of the life. Without the sun, we, we wouldn't have life. Our last word with, that we're going to share today is miskobiwabik. Uh, miskobiwabik. So this, this is the term for copper, actually. Um, it's an animate noun, again, a living being. Um, some people also refer to copper as miskwabik, which is an inanimate noun noun. Misko is to refer to something that is red, a living being that is red. Misqua is to refer to an inanimate being that is red. So this is our word for copper. In Western culture, copper is, copper is a resource to be extracted from the earth and taken from the earth. This computer that I'm using has copper in it. Uh, the phone that I have right next to me has copper in it. Uh, the Anishinaabe people traditionally um, viewed copper as a strong spiritual being um, that deserved reverence and respect. 
1964, um, some Anishinaabe leaders sent a petition to Washington DC complaining about how the treaty um, treaties weren't fulfilled and some of them were, um, the, those promises weren't being fulfilled. In that treaty, they referred to copper as Misko Biwabic. So they referred to copper, the resource that was being taken from our lands as this animate being who was basically being extracted. Okandakan, another Anishinaabe chief, he referred to copper as our hope and our protection when he was basically having an argument with a trader who wanted to um, trade some copper from him. And in response, Okandakan, he said, thou askest much from me, <clears throat> far more than if thou hadst demanded one of my daughters. The lump of copper in the forest is a great treasure for me. It was so to my father and grandfather. It is our hope and our protection. Through it, I have caught many beavers, killed many bears. Through its magic assistance, I have been victorious in all my battles and with it, I have killed many foes. So that speaks to the respect that we have for copper and why it deserves um, reverence. Misa you, um, that's it. That's all I have to offer for right now. I wanna remind you of our uh, learning outcomes for this past 20 minutes or so. Uh, we gained a broad understanding of the Anishinaabe's relationship with the environment through the method of language. Hopefully enhance the understanding of your field through adding an indigenous perspective. Experience some paradigm shifts in the way that we view the environment such as copper and as not just a resource, but also a uh, living spiritual being. Gishpin Bakana Ganesa de Tanawa get a Kimanan. I think we it's a different way to view our world. And Bungo Sandan is a Chikayang Nanda Gekinanda Win Oma. I think we all learned from each other today, and I'm looking forward to learning from the others. <clears throat> Here's some recommended resources if you're looking to read a little more into the environmental relationship of Indigenous peoples. Um, and the environment. Uh, Breeding Sweetgrass, I reference Robin Wall Kimmerer. Portage Lake is by Maud Keg. She's from Mille Lacs. Um, Kichigami is a anthropological text by Johan George Cole, a uh, study on the Ojibwe people. The Myth of Human Supremacy by Derek Jensen, uh, one of my favorite books. Miigwech Bizendawieg, thank you all for listening. Feel free to contact me at any time. There's my email. Um, I'm happy to answer questions at the end and then also through email as well. So Miigwech, thank you so much. All right, thanks Bazil, that was really good. I love seeing the uh, wild racing video. All right, Let's see. And yeah, people just kind of hold their questions toward the end. You can enter it in the Q&A box uh, or the chat box. And so, and I'll introduce our next speaker. Um, and that, I'll just share my screen briefly here. This is um, the list of the speakers. And uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> This will be uh, Farron Davis Anderson. She's a environmental sciences supervisor for the Shakopee uh, Midwalkin Sioux community. They're uh, located in the south part of the Twin Cities metro area. And she's a member of the uh, Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. And I was gonna show the screen, which I didn't have time to show before, but it's just a, a map of some of, the, some of the Dakota land highlights and features and names uh, for the kind of natural features in the Twin Cities. All right, with that, we'll just go to uh, Baron and I will share my screen. Hello, thank you for the introduction. And I just wanted to say Chimi Gwich to Bazil for that um, presentation that he just gave, it was really uh, well put together and I learned some new words. So thank you, Chi Um I just wanna make sure that everybody can see my 
uh, screen. Looks good. Oh, good. Um, so, Buju in Dinewe Magnaduk, Anin, Han Matakiape, Farron Davis Anderson, Indigenous Cause, uh, Mikanak Weiji Indunji, C. Pasing Indunji. And what I said there was hello, all my relatives. My name is Farron Davis Anderson. I'm from the Turtle Mountains. Um, I'm from Belcourt, North Dakota. That's the place near the stream. I grew up like Bazile. I grew up on the reservation in North Dakota. I went to school there from grade school to high school. And then after high school, I attended the uh, Turtle Mountain Community College, which is our local um, tribal college. And I received my associates, um, associate degrees there. And then I transferred to um, North Dakota State University and graduated from there with a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resource Management. And then after um, college, I had a few positions and had the opportunity to work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Conservation Corps of Minnesota, Prairie Restorations. And then I finally landed at the Shakopee Metawakan Sioux community in 2016. And I started out there as an environmental technician and um, was able to go back to school and get my master's degree in um, natural resource stewardship through Colorado State University. And I focused on ecological restoration there at that university. And it tied really nicely into a lot of um, work that we do for the community. And so now um, after many years, I've been promoted and I'm the supervisor of environmental sciences for the community. And so I just wanted to give you some context about the community. Um, we're located in Scott County, Minnesota. So that's really close to Minneapolis, um, just 30, 30 miles southwest. This blue polygon right here is the community boundaries. Um, and we're just north of Prior Lake. So I wanted to also give you context about how Scott County looked prior to uh, settlement or colonization. And so the area in the pink is, um, is what's known as the big woods. And if you're familiar with that, there's a lot of deciduous trees in that area. So there was once a lot of maples, oaks, basswoods, but along the river, we also had you know, a lot of prairies and oak openings. So this just gives you kind of a view of what the landscape looked like pre-contact. Currently, Scott County is one of the fastest growing counties in Minnesota. And I live in Prior Lake, so I got um, a magazine from our county. And this was just, I thought it was really interesting. Um, between 2010 and 2020, the population has increased a lot. It's gone up 16%. And you can see the demographic has really changed too. And so with that increase in population comes industrial development, increased housing development. So the landscape in Scott County has changed significantly with just within the last 10 years. And I thought this was a nice um, visual of that. And so this is a map from the USDA and it explains the land cover category. So it's meant for farm you know, farming data. And this yellow and green is corn and soybeans, which is, you know, what's grown in Minnesota very commonly. But the gray is the development that you can see. So there's low intensity, medium intensity, and open spaces. So the map on the left is from 2010. And you can see there's development around Prior Lake, Shakopee, um, over by Burnsville and Savage. But you can, when I move to the left, this is the map from 2021. And you can really see that the um, development has increased a lot in the past 10 years. And I thought that was just a nice visual to understand what we're dealing with and what we're working with in our community. Because, um, you know, as I showed you in the map prior, the community is really located in the southwest um, corner of all that development. So there are um, you know, limited opportunities, 
to do restoration, um, reconstructions with the habitat. And, and that's kind of what we're contending with in the development to the Southwest. I really um, love being an empl employee of the Shakopee Meadowakton Sioux community. They have a good set of values and that's listed there. They strive to be a good neighbor, a good steward of the earth, um, a good employer. And so with that, you know, being a good steward of the earth, um, they're one of the only governments in Scott County that's actively seeking out, you know, land to purchase to restore back to, you know, pre-contact or a natural state. And so um, I think that's a really, really cool um, thing that the community is taking on. And they're really leaders in Scott County and, and showing other communities what can be done, what's possible. And so, um, I wanted to show you this too, because this is the areas that we've, um, a visual of the areas that we've reconstructed or restored. And a lot of these areas are, are prairie reconstructions. Um, so since 1999, the community has uh, reconstructed over a thousand acres of prairie. We've um, uh, restored close to 50 acres of oak savanna and we've, restored several larger wetland complexes. And so you can see this area is kind of one of the only areas that there's development to the west, you know, development over to the north uh, east, and it's kind of just encroaching on the community. And so when we have opportunities to seek out um, new land purchases, we're really cognizant of like what type of um, restorations or reconstructions we can do on the landscape because unfortunately in Scott County there's not a lot of you know remnant plant communities left there's very few um, a lot of the land was converted for agricultural uses and a lot of the remnant um, areas left in the county are along the river and those are managed by uh, state and uh, federal agencies like the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Minnesota DNR. I wanted to um, give you an example of two different restorations that we're, look, we're working on currently and, um, and how I incorporate traditional knowledge into those restorations because I'm reconnecting with my um, you know, cultural um, teachings. I'm actively you know, going, seeking out information that can help me you know, be a better relative to our plant nations, our bird nations, the animal nations. And that's, I'm really glad that Bazile was before me because he gave a really good understanding of what our worldview is. And so the Dakota and the Ojibwe people, they have similar worldviews, but obviously tribes aren't a monolith and um, there are differences, but they're also our similarities. And one of those similarities is that we view, you know, our plant relatives, our um, birds, trees as animate objects. And so when you're viewing those um, plant animals as a relative, essentially, it's um, easier to, to, to think about how you want to restore them back to the landscape. And so this was a 16 acre oak savanna that was started uh, last year in September. And so it's on the bluff and it's a really good opportunity because we don't have a lot of opportunities to restore oak savannas and especially on the bluff. And so you can see there's an existing ATV track in there and that was important to the community. We have a uh, natural resource and infrastructure work group that um, we're normally meeting with. We're telling them about our restorations and getting their feedback about what our goals for restorations wanna look like. And I think that's really important to not only be able to educate the community and community members, but to get their feedback and buy-in and, and support for these restorations. And they're very supportive of, um, you know, restoring oak savannas, prairies, wetlands. Um, and they wanna reconnect with those landscapes and those relatives. 
So some of the goals for this restoration um, was to reestablish at least 70 dry prairie and woodland edge plant species. And a lot of those species were culturally re relevant. So for example, we wanna bring back American hazelnut um, and wild plum because those are just providing more opportunities for our community to go out, harvest, learn, reconnect, um, and that's always in the back of my mind when I'm doing a restoration is how can I provide these opportunities for community members to get out in the landscape and reconnect with their, you know, heritage, culture, and, and provide opportunities for teachings in the landscape too. But um, they wanted to keep the ATV track. That was really important. Um, if I had it my way, I probably would have taken it out. But I also didn't want to take that away from the community because you're providing an opportunity to for recreation, whether it you know on an ATV or walking. Um, so that was really important, and you know we want to reestablish the disturbance regime, and that includes fire and grazing. And fire was a cultural practice, and so we want to return that to the landscape to help perpetuate this system and help it reestablish. The next project I want to talk about is a, is a longer term project, oak savannas and, you know, prairie restorations. They're a little bit shorter and easier to manage, but we wanted to uh, tackle this because um, you, as you saw on the map, a lot of this, a lot of the area around here was forested with deciduous species. And so we wanted to reconstruct an oak savanna. And um, this area was once a, uh, farmed for basically the last 80 years. And so um, to start this reconstruction, we wanted to establish an understory, um, basically the ground layer that was tolerant of a lot of different various light conditions. Sorry, that's my dog in the background. Um, and we wanted to do that because obviously forest reconstructions can take a very long time. It's not a project that's going to you know, be complete in five years, we're talking 20, 25 years, 40 years. And so that's something too, that the community is really cognizant about. They want to plan for that seventh generation. They don't want to plan only for their grandkids. They want to plan for their grandkids, grandkids. And so when you have that in the back of your mind too, you, you're thinking in very long time frames. And I feel like for humans, it's really easy for us to get caught up in our lifespans aren't very long. So it's like, oh, you know, 10 years is a long time, but really it's not. And so this project is one of those projects where we're going to see, we're not going to see the fruits of our labor for a long time, but when we do, you know, in 30 years or 40 years, it's going to be pretty special. And so after we established that uh, ground layer in 2018, um, we kind of let it establish a little bit. We wanted to do some invasive species management, um, just to make sure that it was established really nicely. And then we um, planted, we started to plant tree species um, last year. And our goal is to plant uh, 25,000 tree seedlings over a five year period. And we might actually bump that up to 10 years. And the reason for that is because um, we want to have different age cohorts within the trees. And so the species composition will be, you know, mostly made up of oak species. And um, we want to focus on bur oaks because they're less susceptible to oak diseases like oak wilt and bur oak blight. And then the rest will be um, sugar maple and other hardwood species. Um, and then we're going to try to incorporate some fruit bearing shrubs. And so to finish out the project, um, we want to establish more ground layer after the trees establish. We want to create a trail system for community members. Uh, we want to create habitat for wildlife species and again reestablish the disturbance regime. Um, manage for invasive species, reduce deer browsing. We did that by a set, we're putting up a fence and we just wanna create a really resilient, diverse oak basswood forest for the community to enjoy and create a site, a future site for harvesting, um, to collect medicines, to um, collect fiber. And um, 
that was that was that project. So we're gonna it's gonna be a while, and I'm I'm really excited to to and for the future for that one. I mean, this is just some data that we took for planting trees because we didn't want to plant them in rows. We wanted it to make it look more natural, so we had to hire a crew. And we were able to plant about 385 trees a day with that crew. And then because it was a drought this year, the soil was so compacted and hard, um, we needed to bring in a bobcat to help those poor, poor CCMers. I felt really bad. So we eventually got a bobcat out there and they were able to knock out 754 trees a day, which is just incredible. Um, and then if you, if you want to learn more about our natural or land and natural resources department, we have a video um, on YouTube and it, and it explains a lot of different projects that we're involved in because, you know, habitat restoration is only one component of our land department. We have um, a water quality or water resources department and they focus on water quality and a lot of other things like wild rice, um, uh, wild rice establishment and, and health management. And so if anybody's interested in um, viewing this video, it's about 20 minutes long. I can send a link to people. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I have now. And my dog has been, been uh, bugging me throughout the whole presentation. So I'm sorry if you couldn't hear me. But if you have any questions at the end, I'd be more than happy to answer. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk. Um, yeah, and that, that's kind of what I had. All right. Thanks a lot, Farron. Uh, yeah, and uh, Farron was one of our SER Midwest chapter members. That's how we located her to um, ask her to speak. All right, and uh, yeah, so our last speaker is uh, Brian Van Stippen, and he's a program director for the National Indian Carbon Coalition, a member of the United Nation in Wisconsin. And I believe he's calling from Green Bay. Is that right, Brian? That is correct. All right, you can go ahead. Good deal, Saguli. My name is Brian Van Stippen. I am the program director for the National Indian Carbon Coalition. I greet you in my traditional language as a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. We are a member of the Iroquois Nation or the Six Nations. Um, and we were located from New York State to London, Ontario in Canada, and then finally to the Green Bay area in which we have a 65,000 acre reservation in which part of the city limits of Green Bay are within the exterior boundaries of our reservation. So I live and reside near our reservation lands, not quite on our lands, um, but I am a tribal attorney by trade. I've worked for the Ho-Chunk Nation in Western Wisconsin Prior to that, did a short stint at the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. And before that, I did work uh, for my tribe within our tribal judicial system, as well as in our tribal law office before transitioning over to the program director for the National Indian Carbon Coalition. So what I'm going to do today is just give us a little background on what the National Indian Carbon Coalition is doing in Indian country um, and share some information with everyone to kind of wrap up this presentation. Um, of what we had today. And I don't want to start there. I want to start with my presentation. So get to that point. So as I mentioned, um, I'm the program director for the National Indian Carbon Coalition. Who we are and what we do, um, we were founded by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation and the Intertribal Agricultural Council. The Indian Land Tenure Foundation is based out of Little Canada, Minnesota. Uh, near Shakopee, just north of there, as well as IAC, which is based in Billings, Montana. Those are the two primary organizations that are tribal nonprofit entities that have been operating in Indian country for over 50 years. So what we try to do at the National Indian Carbon Coalition as a nonprofit under that umbrella is work with tribal nations in the lower 48, Alaska Native Village and Corporations, Native Hawaiian organizations, as well as First Nations in Canada to help them understand and move through the complex process of developing carbon sequestration projects on tribal land. Why do we want to do this? Because we want to protect and preserve our land base in Indian country, as well as protect and preserve our natural resources for so long. We've seen extraction and exploitation of natural resources in Indian country as the primary objective. 
Uh, we believe that carbon projects are going to be one of the ways that we can keep our natural resources in the ground for generations to come. As Farron said, you know, we look at seven generations ahead. My statement is that we've been here for time immemorial. Tribes are going to be here for time immemorial. So we need to ensure that we are protecting and preserving our natural resources. And one of the reasons that we want to do this is to address climate change. We see often um, as tribes are unable to pick up and move the exterior boundaries of the reservation, that as climate change affects the world, it, it has a negative and detrimental effect on tribal lands, even more so because we cannot relocate from where we are currently situated. Um, historically, we see the extraction of our oil, natural gas, coal, timber, pastures uh, for non-tribal members, non-tribal use uh, with all the exterior boundaries of the reservation. So again, we're trying to make sure that we're keeping the decision-making control over that land base by the tribes themselves. Uh, the economic opportunities that we're starting to see are just tremendous and, and, and growing every day. The industry has changed. Uh, when I began about five years ago at the National Decarbon Coalition, even from two years ago, uh, having some of these conversations with tribes and indigenous communities that's the direction that they wanted to go, the, the understanding of what carbon markets were to them. And we were, we've were we been able to start to educate uh, indigenous peoples as to what these projects actually mean for their communities and mean for their land base and, and get them to enroll into different types of projects and opportunities. Some of the benefits that we see are revenue generation, uh, the preservation of tribal land ownership, promotion of land stewardship, greenhouse gas reduction, as well as the promotion of soil health, ecological diversity, and water and air quality. The last portion there, we call that a co-benefit. If a tribe is able to put uh, a carbon sequestration project on top of their land, they have additional co-benefits. One of the things that we are currently working on through a USDA conservation innovation grant is to develop a co-benefits tool in which one part of that besides soil, air, water, is looking at uh, the societal and cultural component of how these projects benefit tribal communities. Uh, in Indian country, we have many health issues with diabetes and heart disease, and our belief and some of our uh, first projects that we're showing here and testing and developing the data are displaying that by protecting and preserving that natural resources, bringing back quality food sources into the regions, that is having a positive effect on tribal community health. Our primary activities is what we want to do when we engage with the tribal community or an indigenous people is provide unbiased independent information and data to tribes. Uh, for far too often, we've seen a lot of for-profit developers entering into Indian country wanting to work on these types of projects. And a lot of those for-profit organizations do solid work. However, in my opinion, they don't have the best interest of Indian country at heart. Uh, usually what occurs is those for-profit developers enter into a short-term contract five to seven years uh, for some of these projects, which range from 40 to 100 years. Um, and then when that contract ends, they move on to the next tribal project, well, allowing the tribe to sit there and manage the project for the duration of the, of, of the term. Um, we also do some web mapping work. Uh, originally, uh, some of the tribes I have been engaged with, it was very difficult to get information on the land base itself. So we put together a program to help tribes develop and create electronic maps often, far too often, unfortunately. As I would engage with the tribal community, they would roll out a Department of Transportation map and say, this is our land holdings. And it's just extremely difficult to make sound uh, management decisions if you don't have a great understanding of where your land base is located. And then offer education and guidance on carbon sequestration. Uh, Carbon sequestration projects are extremely complex. The marketplace is changing every day. There's a ton of movement that's occurring. Um, and so we want to be that trusted resource in Indian country that as tribes have questions, concerns, they can come to us as a tribal nonprofit managed by tribal members uh, or created by tribal members that they can get the information that they need. So what are the steps that we look at when we start to develop a carbon project on tribal lands? First of all, what we need to do is a feasibility study. I have received uh, through the federal government some funding to help tribes create the feasibility studies. So what we have to do is enter into a memorandum of understanding with the tribal nation so that we can be be begin to build a relationship with them and collect the data that is necessary to create the feasibility study. Uh, this is starting to 
this time frame is starting to go down a little bit. Or here I have three months. We're starting to get down to about eight weeks just because of uh, new newer tools that are being developed, um, as well as new information that's being shared nationwide. Once we would move into a feasibility study and it is proven to be economically viable to move forward with the project, we have the heavy lift, the inventory, the quantification, the modeling, uh, the scheduling, and the reporting. So this process takes about nine months. This is just us working with the project developer and the force inventory teams to gather all of the information so that we can provide this to one of the registries through the California Air Resources Board to ensure that our science and our data is adhering to the standards set by the marketplace. Verification and registry review. After we do our research, we then send it to the registry itself and they review and double check and triple check all of our data and information. And that can take quite a long time because they don't need to move at our pace, they get to move at their pace. Um, and throughout that entire process, we're looking at credit sales. So uh, part of my job at the National Decarbon Coalition is developing relationships with corporate buyers, um, universities, individuals, whoever may be interested in purchasing carbon credits from indigenously, domestically based carbon projects. And then finally, as I mentioned, these projects can operate between 40 and 100 years. Uh, and that's where there's a lot of internal staffing that needs to be completed uh, by the tribe itself. So we wanna ensure that everybody has the knowledge and understanding as to what it takes to manage this project for that duration. So again, the carbon feasibility study, this is some of the information that we're gonna be looking for, the inventory data, the ferris Marty's plan, growth and yield data, and the mapping of the targeted lands. And then what do we get from that? We're gonna calculate how much carbon is gonna be sequestered in your land base. So currently we've been focusing mainly on forest-based projects, but we are starting to look at other opportunities such as grasslands, row crop lands, agricultural lands, um, and there's even opportunities for tribes that may have peat bogs. So throughout this adventure that we've created uh, working with tribes, uh, we developed other relationships. Uh, one main one that we've been working on specifically with the Minnesota chapter has been the Tribal Land Conservation Initiative. Um, and so partnering with the, the, the Nature Conservancy, we've created this program to try to make it an easier process for tribes to want to engage in the marketplace. And we have since uh, add, and now added some more tribes, but I'm going to highlight a few here. Uh, that we've been working with. So what we do at the National Recovery Coalition is that we contract for the entire duration of the project. Uh, we promote only entering projects on the voluntary carbon market, and that is uh, 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 there are some legal reasons for that, but uh, mainly the du time duration. It's 40 years on the voluntary market compared to 100 years on the compliance market, which would be the California cap and trade market. Uh, we cover the upfront costs so that the tribe does not have to come to the table with any capital. Uh, we contract with all of the third party consultants, so that does not need to be done in house at the tribe. And we also state we will not sell carbon credits for less than $10 of credit. Um, that, that number right now is being shown to be relatively low. A lot of the organizations and entities I'm talking to are seeing a higher price point, even at this time, um, especially when we started this uh, program about a year ago. Um, and then I also allow tribes to have some state into who would purchase the carbon credit. So a lot of times oil and gas are, and utilities are the industry that is looking to purchase carbon credits. We're starting to see new different groups of buyers such as Amazon, Disney, Microsoft, General Mills, Delta Airlines, uh, all kinds of different entities are now entering into this marketplace looking for high quality, high integrity carbon credits. So as I mentioned, we have a couple projects that we have ongoing. Uh, the, this is the first one that we moved forward, and I'm going to play a short video here in a few minutes um, highlighting this project that's with the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior to Chippewa. They're in northern Minnesota, just outside of Duluth and Cloquet, Minnesota. We're doing an 8,200 acre project generating approximately 440,000 carbon credits, and that's going to bring in about $5.7 million in revenue for the tribe. We're also working with the Keweenaw Bay Indian community up over by Bazil, uh, where he is, um, just north of Marquette in Leonce, Michigan, up in the UP. This is a 16,500 16, acre project, creating 834,000 credits, which is gonna generate about 
And again, I'm projecting these numbers to be a little bit low because they're priced at that $10 price point, which we are currently getting offers closer to the $15 mark. And then most recently, we contracted with the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians down in obviously Mississippi on a 26,000 acre project that's going to generate about 1.7 million credits over 10 years with a revenue projection of $24 million. So that was going through my information quickly. I wanted to go back and, and play this video that we set up with the Fond du Lac Band and in connection with the Nature Conservancy, the TNC paid for all the production to get this completed and we put this together. Looking here, these are the wild rice beds on the Fond du Lac Band next to Pure Chippewa Reservation. So I just want to... I think we lost the uh, audio, Brian. Was there any audio that you could hear? In the beginning, I think like first 30 seconds, a minute or something, then it stopped. Oh, that's well, anyway, they're, they're all on YouTube if you want to look at them. Today we are going to talk about the evolution of water resources. At all. Sorry about that. I'm not certain what happened there with the, the audio. So, again, that, that information was being played on the IndianCarbon.org website. If anybody wants to go there and check it out, um, we also have a, a video that we put together specifically on the Fond du Lac Band project that's on the Nature Conservancy Tree, Soil and Water campaign website, if you wanna go there. And I'll drop those into the chat here um, as I drop off and pass it back on over to our hosts. So thank you everybody, I appreciate that. Sorry about that video, losing the audio there. Okay, thanks a lot, Brian. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for all the speakers. Those are really great, all of them, quite a variety of topics there. For sure. And uh, so now we have time for yeah discussion and questions. It looks like there's a number in the Q and A box, and I think Natalie was collecting some from the room with the students. Do you want to read some of those, Natalie? Yeah, I'll be. Um, um, we're collecting in-person questions right now, but um, uh, I'll go ahead and read the first one from the box. Everyone can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I hear you. Our first question um, is uh, from Caro Silvola, and the question is, as a plant biologist, I have struggled a lot with the scientific classification, Latinized names for all the relatives around us. What strategies do you have for scientists looking to uplift and address or discuss beings while paying proper respect to their original indigenous names? I can probably answer this one or try to answer it since I spoke a little bit about language. Um, those plant names are, are really special. I'd, I'd recommend working with your local uh, community members, indigenous people. Um, 
the bilingualism is is a big push right now for um, things like our street signs in Redcliffe. We're we're the first tribe in Wisconsin to have a um, to have a town boundary sign in the Ojibwe language. So steps like that are important. to suggest that plant biologists start to use not only the English word, but then also the Latin term, and then also the indigenous word for, for whatever that plant is. And make sure that's um, informed, not by, not by yourself pursuing um, online resources, which are important, but make sure that's informed by local indigenous community members and, and they can provide that, those plant names and also the consent to do so. So I'd, uh, that's how I'd go about it. Miigwech, thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, and, and this second question is from our uh, watching party audience, and this is for Farron. Um, the question is, how do you feel about the movement to return national parks to tribes? How would you approach it if you had access to restoration projects in these parks? I'm all for it, <laughs> land back. <laughs> um, if I had access to parks or even, you know, local state, federal lands that are, you know, near us, I can think of at least two or three, four different areas that I would love to help, you know, the managers there do some more restoration work. I know that states and even the federal government sometimes have limited budget, limited time. So I feel like if we could collaborate or, um, you know, even give that to a community that's more able to um, do restorations or reconstructions, that would be awesome. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's important. And I think that Tribes are often at the forefront of a lot of environmental issues. And um, I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. And especially in Minnesota, you know, Fond du Lac, Mille Lacs, all the Northern tribes there, you know, on the forefront of wild rice restoration and um, making sure that the state is accountable to put those uh, wild rice lakes on um, the impaired lakes list. So I feel like, yeah, that's uh, that's that's really important. And, and Baron, I just wanted to follow up on that. So the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe over by Bemidji in Minnesota is getting through congressional action about 15,000 acres of the Chippewa National Forest returned to the tribe. And we've been engaging with Leech Lake to look at the development of a covered project, but specifically including that land base in the covered project, because our philosophy is that we can derive revenue from that land by getting it returned to tribal hands. We can then reacquire more of our traditional lands. Um, we're also working with Boys Fort uh, over by Net Lake in northern Minnesota for a very similar project. The Minnesota Conservation Fund acquired some land uh, through a, a private sale with 27,000 acres of that being on the Boys Fort Reservation. And now we're working to help reacquire that land by purchase. And then in order to offset the purchase price, of develop a carbon sequestration project on top of that land base. We're starting to see this happen, you know, specifically in the Midwest here, state of Minnesota. I think it's going to really start to take hold nationwide. Excellent, thank you. Um, uh, here's another a question from the box. Oh, right there. Um, this is addressed to the BBE department. Uh, how will you take responsibility in respecting tribal sovereignty within the department? Beyond hosting seminars, will you actively incorporate curriculum that focuses on the responsibility of students or alumni as engineers to be respectful stewards on stolen land? Um, I'm, I can speak a little bit to about the curriculum piece. Um, that is one of our, our efforts in our, our BBE's department uh, or our DEI uh, committee is uh, starting to incorporate uh, different different perspectives and different experiences and different um, um, viewpoints uh, in, 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 um, in some of our classes. And, and this is kind of just the starting point really, uh, at starting point of that. And so, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else from the BBE wanted to comment as well.
Oh, yeah. I mean, I think we're, we're talking about definitely trying to include this in in our courses that we you know teach in ecological engineering, design, and various things like that. I think um, you know it's a first step or trying to learn uh, from speakers like this. And uh, I mean, the other parts parts of this question, I'm not sure I'm really able to speak for all of BBE and engineers in that way. But you know, we're trying. You know, we're not perfect. We're trying to. Uh, you know, to do good things. I mean, um, incorporate, you know, try to learn from things like this and, you know, incorporate it to what we're doing. And uh, yeah, I mean, the students that come out of here, they do work for engineering companies uh, and a lot of different places, nonprofits too. And, uh, you know, they kind of do what they're trained to do and work for those kind of places, but there's a wide yeah, variety of, of places where they would go afterwards. Um, I don't know, maybe Gary Sands would be a good person to answer part of this question if he's there. Maybe he's not anymore. He's our department head. All right, well. Do we have any more questions? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, here's another question from our viewing party from the audience. Uh, what are some of your recommendations of organizations to get involved with as an employer that help promote restoration and reciprocity with our natural resources? And I suppose this is for all any of the panelists. Can you, can you repeat the question? I didn't, I didn't uh, hear the first part of it, sorry. Of course, sorry about that. Um, what are some of your, do you have any recommended organizations to get involved with um, as uh, that, that, that sort of help promote restoration and reciprocity with natural resources? Um, well, in the Twin Cities, I, I can think of one, it's called the Lower Flan um, Creek Project. Um, and they're, they're doing a lot of habitat restoration and there's opportunities to volunteer. Um, I can put it in the chat their their um, website, but if you're local, that's a really good opportunity to learn more about you know reciprocity and how other um, nonprofits are helping out. Yep, there it is. Somebody put it in the chat. It's a I, I would reach out to them and then. There's also the um, Dream Wild Health, which is not specifically for ecological restoration, but they're helping with the rematriation of seeds. So different types of um, traditional seeds, and that doesn't include, um, you know, it might include corn or squash or other uh, crops that were traditionally grown and they have opportunities to um, they have opportunities to volunteer too. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of resources around or organizations I should say that are nonprofits and those are two that I know of. Yeah, I would also um, recommend maybe uh, some of the agencies. I can speak for kind of Wisconsin and Michigan. Michigan has the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition that uh, does a lot of EJ work. Um, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission is a governmental agency uh, in, in between for the federal, um, on the federal end, and then also advocates for its member tribes. They have a lot of internships, like every summer, um, they do some manumen or wild rice bed restoration. Great Lakes Intertribal Council, that's uh, G-L-I-T-C, Glitzy, um, they do restoration work a lot of environmental work and um, treaty rights. So uh, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission is glifwc.org, glifwick.org, and then Glitzy, uh, Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition. And that's what I can name off the top of my head right now. There, there's a group with um, associated with Society for Ecological Restoration called the International Network for Seed-Based Restoration. It's been trying to improve mm -hmm. uh, access to seeds. Um, yeah, so that it's produced by government agencies and nonprofits and stuff. But, well, we got a few minutes left. I think we got time for a few more questions. <clears throat> Do 
Sure. Our next one appears for Farron. Um, have you experienced any situations where the pre-settlement vegetation is not possible to establish because of new pressures from climate change or development? Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes there's just areas that are too far pushed back with, you know, the soils are, a lot of the soils are lost or too compacted or, you know, there's just other environmental constraints. And so that's something too that we're always thinking about is how, you know, climate change is becoming, um, obviously it's, it's a huge issue and it's really unpredictable. And there's, you know, there's trends of what, what can we, or models that can help us try to predict what climate change is going to, how it's going to impact our plant communities. But, um, you know, that's, that's a really difficult task. And so one of the things that we're really concerned about is with maples in our forest, because the trends say that it's going to be a lot wetter um, and that's going to negatively impact um, maple regeneration. And that's, you know, obviously a culturally significant species. We um, harvest maple syrup every spring. And so those are things that we're cognizant of. And if we have an opportunity to do any restorations or reconstructions, we're thinking of, okay, how is this gonna, you know, look? And is this an area that's gonna be, you know, really wet and not suitable for this species in the future? And I think that, you know, you, you can only work with what you know, and you can use the models to you the best of your ability. But again, that's, you know, there's, there's so many different things that you have to try to incorporate when you're planning and we don't know what we don't know yet. So um, it's a difficult task, but I have, I have hope for the future. And I think that, you know, if we're taking good care of our plant relatives, we can make cognizant decisions on how we should, um, you know, bring them back or try to keep them around. Well, yeah, we, we're, I just want to point out we're at 7.15. If anybody really needs to go, um, definitely should, should go. But uh, if anybody who wants to stay on, we don't have to you know, end the call. We could stay and talk for a few more minutes. I don't know if, Gary, you wanted to talk about this curriculum question? I'd be happy to uh, chime in here. Um, Is my, am I coming through? Yep. Yeah, I see our panelists heads nodding. So uh, great, you know, I, I appreciate that question about the curriculum. And um, as, I, as I put in the chat there, I would love to meet with students and others to really take up that idea and uh, brainstorm about what might be possible. I think it's an excellent suggestion and I think it's something we need to be um, thinking about as we think forward with our with our programs and our curricula. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'll hand, take it over, Chris. Oh, I was just, now I just turned on my camera. I don't, do we have other more uh, questions we want to go through here? Do we have do people want to stay on after? I, I can, we can stay a couple more minutes myself, but do any of the speakers need to, need to go? Yeah, I see, I just see a couple of these in, in the chat I wanted to address. You know, basically for carbon project development, what we're looking at is keeping trees, keeping grasslands, keeping traditional native uh, grasslands in place. So the intent is rather than what we see a lot in the Northwest with tribes or even in the Menominee Nation in Wisconsin, it's a lot of commercial logging operations. Um, by keeping those old growth forests in place is how you can derive revenue by eliminating logging. Um, and so again, from my perspective at the National Indian Carbon Coalition, protecting and preserving natural resources rather than extracting or exploiting those natural resources and still being able to derive revenue because we still have to manage that land. Um, uh, with the Fond du Lac project, they're having an issue right now 
with the emerald ash borer, killing a lot of the ash trees. Uh, we're trying to get seedlings from Red Lake Nursery. Uh, Red Lake Tribe is one of the only tribal nurseries in Minnesota and in the Midwest. Um, and so we want to ensure that we're replanting trees that are going to adhere to the climate that we're going to see change over time. As I said earlier, the, the tribal chairman at Sound Alike made this statement on camera. We can't move the exterior boundaries of our reservation. As climate change comes down over the next generations, we have to be prepared and we need to start preparing now. And that's what Farron is doing on her end internally. Um, and a lot of tribes have their internal staff looking at these issues so that we can begin to reintroduce some of our traditional uh, trees and grasslands and plants in to protect and preserve those areas um, so that we have those for future generations. And a lot of times what we look at when we want to protect those forests or those grasslands are those cultural resources that are near and dear to tribal nations' hearts that have been a part of their society for generations. Um, and so it's working very closely with staff like Farron to make sure that we're doing what is in the best interest of that tribe, putting on the ground what they want there, what we know that our uh, ancestors lived with and cultivated over time and generations and putting that back in place. I just want to say that I, I really like that you brought up that fact to that, you know, the tribal boundaries, they're not going to change. We can purchase, you know, parcels or more land, but we can't move. Yeah. And we're like you saw on the map, we're kind of surrounded. So there's only so many opportunities for our community to expand. And so I think it's important to understand, like we can't move our boundaries from, you know, one location to another part of the state. It just doesn't work like that. We don't have, we wouldn't have, um, you know, the federal recognition, the trust responsibilities of the government. And so I think that's that's really important to, to keep in mind. And that's where we come back to when Bazile started this conversation with the terminology that we use, because we talk a lot in Indian country about traditional ecological knowledge. So tech, and we look at that, and it's not written. It's all verbal. It's passed down from generation to generation. A lot of times, it's done verbally from traditional languages. Again, I'm a member of the Odin Nation. We're Algonquin-speaking community. Um, Bazile is the Anishinaabe. Those two languages aren't one and the same, and so it's very difficult, uh, even when we're talking intertribal, to use the same type of language for the natural resources that we have on our land base and that, again, that we're, we're within our societies. Um, and so understanding that language, being able to keep that terminology alive so that as we get this information passed down from our ancestors and from our grandparents and from our aunts and uncles that are teaching us how to do this now, that we have an understanding of where this came from. And I like how Bazil said, you know, if the trees and the rocks could have a story, they would tell you. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, I mean, Glitch, thank you for bringing that up again. And yeah, TK, traditional ecological knowledge. I think um, we might be a little biased, but I think we all know that Indigenous peoples have had the most sustainable relationship with the earth um, out of any other group of people. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of years of proof of that, that sustainable relationship with the environment. And with the past 6,000 years of the Industrial Revolution and the, the advent of larger society, um, we're, we're kind of in a tough spot right now. We're having to have these conversations on um, how do we have a sustainable relationship with the environment. So I think the, the further integration of Indigenous perspectives into, into your curriculum um, within this, this department and other departments and across all, all universities, I think, uh, I think the better. Well, I know it's getting over the time here by a fair amount and it's just kind of over people's dinner time and stuff. I don't know, do we uh, want to wrap it up or do we want to go uh, go for a few more of these questions? All right, well, I think, uh, yeah, given the time here um just i think i'd like to you know thank the speakers and um you know we can follow up with uh emails to, to them or or us and um again it was really great to have you and i appreciate taking the time and hope to 
yeah, I'll be in touch with you more in the future. Anything else? Anybody, uh, Natalie or Gary, the speakers, anybody want to say anything else? I just wanted to thank you all for coming, uh, sharing your time with us. We had a great turnout here. About 30 people showed up for the watching party, and there was applause after every speaker. Um, so hopefully you felt it. But uh, thank you so much. So many ways, thank you. Yeah, it was super fun talking with you all. Yako is our traditional greeting in Oneida language. Thank you. Yeah, Chimi Gwich. I just wanted to let Bazil know too that um, I've burned with his dad before. No <laughs> so way. I know his dad. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's yeah, he's helped cool. us. <laughs> yeah, he's yep. helped us here at Shakopee. Awesome. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, glad you mentioned fire and, and that. That was pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Funny he's helping us bring back. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Indian country small. Yep. <laughs> All that's right. Awesome.